Today we'll be talking about influenza, a viral infection that causes yearly epidemics, typically affecting up to 15 to 20 percent of the world's population. These annual epidemics lead to approximately half a million deaths around the world each year, and pregnant women, like this 28-year-old freelance photographer, are at especially high risk of developing severe complications. Mel was 32 weeks pregnant when she was brought to the ER one night by her worried husband. She had been suffering from what she thought was a minor cold that began with a cough, headache, and sore throat two days ago. She later also developed a runny nose and itchy, watery eyes. Her husband thought she may have been slightly febrile over the past two days, but tonight she became noticeably warm and started to look very pale. She was lying in bed breathing rapidly when her husband came home from work. Mel told her husband that she felt short of breath, but she wasn't sure if that was a normal pregnancy symptom for someone in the third trimester. This was her first pregnancy, so neither Mel nor her husband knew exactly what to expect. But the pregnancy had gone smoothly, and Mel had received regular prenatal care from an obstetrician and a doula. She had also established a birth plan, which had her giving birth naturally at home with minimal medical intervention, including pain medication. Throughout the pregnancy, she had been meticulous about trying to minimize potentially harmful exposures and had even refused the flu shot, which her obstetrician had recommended since Mel would be pregnant during the peak flu season. At the ER, the physician on duty noted that Mel looked fatigued and unwell, with a fever of 102 degrees Fahrenheit, an elevated heart rate and breathing rate, and an O2 saturation that was decreased to 90% on room air. She was pale and sweating and appeared anxious. On examination of her lungs, the ER physician noted coarse ronchi and decreased breath sounds over the bases of her lungs. Her mucous membranes also appeared dry, suggesting that she was dehydrated from poor fluid intake during her illness. Because of these concerning findings, the ER physician suspected influenza infection. He decided to admit Mel and started her on IV fluids and supplemental oxygen. He then performed a nasal swab and sent it for viral PCR to test for influenza virus, as well as obtaining a sputum sample, which he sent for gram stain and culture. After some consideration, he also ordered a chest x-ray. Despite the fact that radiation exposure from x-rays is avoided if possible during pregnancy, he knew that the risk from this small dose of radiation was outweighed by the need to determine if Mel had developed pneumonia, a complication for which she was at high risk because of her pregnancy. The influenza virus, which enters the host via respiratory droplets from infected individuals, owes its virulence to two major glycoproteins on the virion surface hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Hemagglutinin is the protein responsible for viral binding to respiratory epithelial cells via sialic acid on the cell surface. Neuraminidase cleaves the sialic acid, which releases newly formed virions from the host cell surface. Neuraminidase also decreases the viscosity of the mucous film coating the respiratory tract, exposing the cell surface and facilitating the spread of virus-containing fluid. Within a short time, many cells in the respiratory tract become infected and eventually killed directly by the virus. This damaged respiratory epithelium is then susceptible to secondary bacterial invaders, or superinfection. In addition to being important virulence factors, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase are also the primary targets of the host immune response against influenza, so they're constantly evolving to avoid immune recognition. When these proteins evolve by gradually accumulating point mutations during viral replication, the process is called antigenic drift. Antigenic drift is responsible for the new influenza strains that cause yearly global epidemics and explains why a new flu vaccine has to be developed for each new flu season. The new strains are different enough from previous years to evade host memory responses from previous infection or vaccination. 
but influenza is also unique in its propensity to evolve through a different process called antigenic shift, in which an entirely new hemagglutinin and subtype is introduced into the human population. This can occur either when a non-human strain of influenza gains the ability to infect a human host, or when both human and non-human strains of influenza co-infect a single animal and undergo genetic reassortment. Influenza virus readily undergoes this kind of reassortment due to its segmented genome, and the resulting novel strains are especially dangerous because the entire population lacks protective immunity against them. Antigenic shift has resulted in deadly worldwide pandemics striking once every generation since the beginning of the 20th century. Pregnant women like Mel are at especially high risk of developing serious complications from influenza. In response to the hormonal milieu of pregnancy, the immune system undergoes important adaptations to tolerate the presence of the paternally derived antigens of the fetus. But because these adaptations induce a shift away from cell-mediated immunity, they put the woman at risk for inadequate response to infections. Mel's doctors knew that prompt antiviral treatment for influenza in pregnancy is associated with significantly better outcomes. So shortly after arrival in the hospital, Mel was empirically started on oseltamivir, which targets the influenza glycoprotein neuraminidase. Mel was also given acetaminophen to control her fever, since elevated body temperature can be harmful to the fetus. Mel's chest x-ray results showed bilateral hazy opacities, consistent with a viral pneumonia, but there was no evidence of a focal consolidation that would suggest a bacterial pneumonia. Her sputum gram stain was also negative, so although her cultures wouldn't be finalized for a few days, it appeared most likely that she did not have a bacterial superinfection. Mel's PCR result came back eight hours later and confirmed the diagnosis of influenza. Her condition improved over the next few days, and she was discharged home and continued to be closely followed by her obstetrician. Once she had recovered, Mel agreed to receive the flu vaccine to protect herself and her fetus from infection with different circulating strains of influenza. The doctor explained that even after delivery, her newborn would be protected by Mel's vaccination due to passive immunity acquired across the placenta. After the influenza scare, Mel decided to give birth at the hospital instead of at home, but otherwise she was able to follow her birth plan and she delivered a healthy baby girl at 39 weeks.